Hello and welcome to the next talk in the 2021 series of the Open UK Future Leaders training sessions. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be available soon afterwards in the YouTube channel for Open UK. Uh, first, a little about the Open UK Future Leaders Group. Uh, the Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, uh, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding and innovation as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. It operates under the direction of the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee and has a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. The Future Leaders Group is currently co-chaired by me, Robert Grinnells, and I'm from Field Fisher, and Katie Gibson from Bristow's, and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and to new members, whether they're getting involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects. So please do get in contact if you'd like to get involved. And for today's session, we're pleased to be joined by Javier Serrano, who's head of the hardware and timing section in CERN's Beam Controls Group, where he promotes open hardware in all developments. Uh, Javier has an MSc in Physics and an MSc in Electronics and Engineering, and started working on electronics development for control systems of particle accelerators at CERN after his studies. It's so much more interesting than what I do. Um, Javier is also the leader of the White Rabbit Project, an extension to Ethernet, whose aim it is, is to guarantee tight synchronization and determinism in distributed real-time systems. Uh, Javier will be telling us more about open hardware activities at CERN, a little bit of history, some details about White Rabbit as well, and the latest version of the CERN open hardware license and the importance of free and open source software tools to design open hardware, along with some thoughts on the special role that public institutions have in the development of open source. And now, as usual, we'll have a chance for any questions you might have at the end, so please feel free to pop them in the chat box, and we'll invite you on to voice and video to ask them yourself if you'd like to at the end. Javier, welcome to our session today, and thanks for joining us, and over to you to talk about open hardware at CERN. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Can everybody see the slides? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Thank you for the invitation. By the way, I must say that I have been working with lawyers for the last 10 plus years in the uh, drafting of the CERN Open Hardware License in its various versions, and I have learned a lot from lawyers, and I have found it very interesting. In a way, it's also hacking in the sense that uh, you have a legal problem and you have all these intellectual property tools to solve it. So it has been very interesting to me. So. Uh, Thank you for the invitation and, um, and for the opportunity to talk about open hardware at CERN. Uh, I will um, start by very briefly introducing CERN for those who don't know it. Then I will uh, continue with a brief explanation of what open hardware is in general. And then I'll move on to two contributions from CERN uh, to open hardware. Uh, one is the uh, CERN open hardware license and the other one is our most prominent open source hardware project. Old White Rabbit. And then I'll finish with some uh, reflections on, on public institutions and the role they can play in open source, hopefully triggering uh, questions and debate. So, uh, first of all, CERN. CERN is the biggest uh, physics laboratory in the world. It, uh, its main mandate is to uh, study the fundamental constituents of matter and, uh, and, uh, its in, uh, and their interactions. So it's fundamental research and the way we do it is with a network of particle accelerators and the end product is the beam or the beams, uh, which we provide to physicists so that they can make them collide and uh, look at the outcome of those collisions and uh, investigate uh, issues in fundamental physics. So uh, there is a network of accelerators. The beam goes from one to another, keep being accelerated all the time until it reaches the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is the biggest accelerator at CERN. And in the world, uh, it's 27 kilometers long and it's 150 meters underground uh, straddling the border between France and Switzerland. And in four different places of the LHC, the two counter-rotating beams are made to collide. And uh, around those points, we have uh, so-called detectors. So detectors are huge endeavors. They are 150 meters underground. They are the size of cathedrals. And in this picture, you should imagine the beam coming into the picture uh, at the center and out of the picture for the counter-rotating beam. And they collide at the center and um, uh, the particles and other uh, radiation that comes out 
um, uh, are analyzed by all the electronics and then serialized as data and stored for the long term uh, so that physicists around the world can carry out off offline analysis trying to find, for example, new particles. So the mandate of CERN is actually in a, in a beautiful document called the CERN Convention, which was drafted in the beginning of the 50s. And uh, it contains our main mission, which is, uh, as I said, fundamental research. But there is a lesser well-known uh, part of our mandate, which uh, is equally important, which deals with, uh, with the uh, expectation that sense results uh, will be made available, but also the developments that we carried out in the path to uh, physics discoveries, for example, should be made generally available. So it is a legitimate question for those of us working at CERN, uh, how this mandate, the sharing mandate, should be interpreted in the technological scene of the 21st century, uh, and uh, in particular for those of us doing hardware design. So we have different communities of, at CERN, and many of us have found that um, open source in its various incarnations is a very efficient way of sharing and of having an impact on society with, with these developments. So there are people doing software and many publish their software as free and open source. Uh, people in charge of data sets use an open data paradigm. Uh, people in publications use a lot of open access. And, and we uh, hardware designers, uh, many of us have found that open hardware is a very, very good tool to share. And of course, being at CERN, we're all very proud that all these types of sharing are enabled by probably the biggest technological contribution uh, of CERN to, to society, which is the World Wide Web. So uh, a few words on open hardware. Uh, I will tell you what it is, of course, but first, why is it uh, becoming so important and why is it a thing? Uh, there is, uh, these last years, there has been a, a, a democratization of access to design in the same way that in the 90s uh, it became much easier and much more accessible to program computers and to write software that other people could find useful. And then as a result of that, it was important for society to find a way uh, to channel that uh, sharing and to make sure it happened efficiently and easily and under good, solid legal conditions. Uh, same, the same thing is happening with hardware now. Uh, this is an example of a boy who was born with a malformation in his hand and uh, he's uh, wearing a, a prosthetic limb, which was designed by his mom, who otherwise does not have, does not have any formal training in engineering or, or design whatsoever. So uh, these are things that would have taken a small or medium enterprise uh, at some point in time, uh, 15, 20 years ago, and now can be done by hobbyists who gather in communities to collaborate and to 3D print their designs. So um, as in the case of software, there is sometimes confusion about what is open hardware and what it isn't. There is some amount of open washing as well. So it's good to have a definition. In the case of hardware, it is kept by the Open Source Hardware uh, Association, uh, which is, uh, and the definition itself is, is uh, inspired by the open source software definition, of course. Uh, it also is inspired by, by free software and it guarantees that there is a number of freedoms that people have to study, modify, distribute uh, and, and sell designs, uh, but also to make hardware based on those designs and distribute that hardware. This is what's kind of different from, from software and we will discuss about that uh, in more depth later. So when we started, actually more than 10 years ago, at CERN to do open hardware, there were a number of challenges that we identified. Our starting point was we had a, 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 a team of people doing hardware and software. Uh, so we were looking for uh, a way to make the hardware designers enjoy a, a, a working experience which would be similar to that of, of their software friends in terms of easiness to interact with the outside world and bringing uh, help without any risk of vendor lock-in, uh, learning from others uh, and attracting talent, etc. So all these things we wanted for the hardware people as well. And we identified mainly four challenges. One, one was at the time it was not so easy to share things online. So um, we, we created the open hardware repository. Today you can upload your designs to many places. Still the open hardware repository has this kind of 
set of curated designs, uh, high quality designs. So it's also very convenient, especially for people in our domain, which is controls and data acquisition for, for big physics facilities. Uh, we discussed with uh, companies that had been working with us up to then uh, under a proprietary paradigm. And we discussed about how they could make a business based on a partially open catalog of modules. Um, and I will have some words to say on that later as well. We very early identified the need for free and open source software tools to design hardware and to share it efficiently. And um, also because uh, companies are not an option in open hardware. You know, you can do open source software without companies if you want, but uh, in hardware at least somebody has to make the things and sell them to you and, and send them. So. Um, uh, because that's not an option. There's one thing that companies uh, uh, try to avoid, it's legal risk, and that's why we decided to uh, create a, a set of open hardware licenses that I will, I will present in more detail later. Just one quick word on uh, the importance of free and open source software tools for hardware design. This is an example of a printed circuit board, the layout, with the, with the several layers in different colors. And it's designed in KiCad. KiCad is a PCB design tool that we have been contributing to for the last 10 plus years. And we are really happy and proud of how much it has evolved and improved through the years. Version 6 is being, uh, it's about to be published these days, uh, about to be released. And um, the, the idea is that uh, free and open source tools and, and formats are part of the sharing of what makes sharing easier. And in the, in the world of PCBs, um, th this is really important because there are a number of proprietary tools. Much of, most of the uh, tools are proprietary, uh, especially the high-end tools, and uh, they have incompatible formats. So uh, there are, uh, plus, plus there is also the market is quite fragmented. Uh, there is not a clear winner, so that uh, there are many chances that if you release a file and you put it out there, uh, the recipient, the person uh, downloading it, uh, might have a license for a proprietary tool to open PCB designs, but it might not be the same one, so there are many chances that they cannot open it and edit it. So that's why it is very important, and, and this is something that we usually take for granted in software, but in, in hardware it can really happen that you can publish something that people cannot open and edit and modify and republish. So uh, a few words about licensing. So when we started uh, publishing designs, we very early noticed uh, that uh, software licenses will, will, would not be completely adequate. Uh, so we decided to, uh, to draft a, a hardware license. And of course, we wanted to capitalize on all the good things from software licenses. So that was our starting point. Most of the uh, software licenses, if not all, are based on copyright. So I, uh, I guess you all uh, know how uh, licenses work in software. So you have, in principle, copyright law, which would not allow you to copy, modify, and republish the work of others. And you can grant, as a licensor, uh, permission to do that kind of thing in exchange for some conditions that you can set. Uh, and there are different conditions in different types of licenses. The nice thing, of course, of copyright is that it's very uniform across countries. It's, it's, it's a very uniform law. So if you draft a license uh, that relies on copyright, uh, you can be pretty sure that it applies uniformly um, in every country. And, um, and then um, software patents are an important thing in some countries. So modern licenses, modern licenses also include a, a license for, for patents. There are three licensing regimes in open source broadly that you know, the communities have evolved until they kind of converge on these three ways of sharing. Uh, so there's the permissive family of licenses, uh, whereas the uh, conditions for sharing from the licensor are very lightweight. Uh, most of the time it's just only attribution. Uh, then weekly reciprocal, that means if I give you a piece of software uh, which is uh, licensed under one of these licenses, like MPL or LGPL, um, if you include it in a bigger work, then if you modify my part, you're supposed to release the modifications uh, to that part under the same license, but you're not required to license your bigger work uh, uh, under that same license. You can keep it proprietary if you want. And the strongly reciprocal family, 
where uh, the obligation is to actually release the whole thing uh, and, uh, under uh, one of these licenses like a a GPL or AGPL, uh, which provides for a virtual circle of sharing where the commons actually gets bigger and bigger. And uh, this is something that, as we shall see, is not easy to achieve for hardware. So uh, moving on to challenges we identified in hardware licensing. First of all, the rights. Uh, for hardware, copyright does not generally apply to physical objects. Uh, it might apply to some especially artsy uh, physical objects, but not in general. It applies more to documents like uh, schematics and uh, layouts, uh, so design documents, uh, but less to objects. So that's a challenge because, of course, if uh, you can look at a chair and you can uh, draw that chair and there's not, nothing keeping you from doing that, therefore I cannot impose on you any obligations of sharing back your improvements, for example, in that case. Uh, then there is patents and uh, the issue with patents is that they are much more prevalent in hardware than in software. They have been there for hundreds of years and what that means is, is that patent licenses are not an option in, in hardware licenses. They have to be there. Uh, issues with reciprocity. Uh, reciprocal licenses are always trickier than permissive ones and in the case of hardware they are especially tricky. One question is what should it mean to be reciprocal for a license in hardware? Um, in, in, uh, in software you get a binary and then you, uh, by virtue of the license, you are entitled to see the sources. Uh, in hardware, uh, the, analog the analogous situation would be that you get a physical object and uh, as a recipient of that physical object, you can access the design files that resulted in that object. And th this is something that we tried to achieve with a certain open hardware license. And then also, what is the scope of reciprocity? Where do the obligations stop? Uh, for example, if I design a printed circuit board and it has resistors in it, do I have to provide the recipe for making resistors out of carbon and metal? Uh, also, when you connect things, when you link things, to, uh, to use the, pe the word people uh, use in software, uh, if I connect my mouse, and uh, my mouse is designed under, under an open hardware license, if I connect it to a PC, does that mean that I have linked with the PC and therefore I have to re uh, release the design files of the PC? So these are questions to be answered uh, by whoever writes uh, uh, an open hardware license. And finally, there are tricky domains in hardware like IC design, integrated circuit design. Uh, people who design chips, they use these high-end tools, many of them proprietary, actually most of them proprietary, and, uh, and often parts of these tools uh, end up in the design itself. There are macros, there are primitives, pieces of silicon that you use, which are proprietarily licensed by the vendor, uh, sometimes a vendor of the tool, sometimes a third party, and um, it's impossible for you to publish the sources. So uh, if you use um, licenses from the software world, the reciprocal licenses from the software world, uh, then there, there is an issue because those would be required, those sources would be required to be published, but there's no way because they are um, proprietarily licensed by the vendors. So in the CERN uh, open hardware license, we take the approach that most of the rights are going to be applying to the design sources like circuit schematics or CAD drawings. This is our assumption. This is what you license under CERN OHL. And then uh, the license, as any other hardware license, specifies conditions for copying the designs, modifying them, uh, distributing modified or unmodified versions of them, but also making hardware and distributing that hardware. It was drafted by Miriam Ayas, who's the uh, uh, legal officer in the knowledge transfer group at CERN. Uh, then Andrew Katz, who brought in many innovative uh, concepts to solve problems in this license, and myself. And because we didn't want to prejudge on the type of sharing that people would use this license for, we, uh, we produced three variants. So a permissive variant, a weekly reciprocal variant, and a strongly reciprocal variant so that people can choose in their community, in their project, what makes sense for them in terms of dynamics for sharing. So how does the CERN OHL tackle each one of these challenges that I um, alluded to earlier? Uh, regarding rights, uh, the license makes no assumption about rights, and this is to give the licensor the biggest possible chance of find, finding a right that will apply and that will uh, 
generate this hook that uh, uh, I was mentioning earlier, which is, you know, that role is played by copyright in, in software licensing. In, uh, in the case of hardware, it will be copyright on the design files very often as well, but not necessarily limited to that. So there are other design rights that people could invoke uh, while using this license. Then regarding patents, we take them very seriously, of course. This is a hardware license, so in addition to uh, me as a licensor promising you that I will not sue you for patent infringement for this particular design, which should be very reassuring for you as a licensee, of course, uh, then we, ha we have a reciprocal kind of uh, clause that says that uh, if, if you as a licensee sue me for patent infringement for this, particular design, then you lose all your rights uh, stemming from this license. It goes both ways, and the uh, goal is to make sure that everybody feels safe using this design and contributing to this design effort. Regarding reciprocity, uh, our, our solution to make sure that the product, uh, the recipient of products gets access to the design files is to protect uh, a URL or any other kind of pointer that would be engraved in the project in the in the product, so uh, it would be physically visible by whoever receives the uh, object, irrespectively of how many hands it has gone through. And uh, in terms of um, establishing the limits of reciprocal obligations, Andrew came up with these two concepts of product and available component. So. Zooming in, that means going down in the hierarchy, uh, we find the concept of available component, and uh, in the previous example I gave of the resistor, a resistor is an available component. This reflects current practice in hardware design. In, in hardware design, people don't ask themselves how to make a resistor, they just buy it. You have many, many vendors for the same type of resistor, so it's just available. Therefore, uh, because it qualifies as an available component as per the license, you have no obligation to provide the sources. Um, and then, and then going up, uh, there's a notion of product. So to illustrate with the example I gave about the mouse on the PC, product is whatever you make out of the design files that you licensed under the CERN OHL, and the obligation stops there. So it would stop in the mouse and not uh, move to, uh, and cover uh, the PC that you connect your mouse to. Okay. And then finally, these, these problems with the uh, design ecosystem, the, the software that people use to create, for example, integrated circuits. Uh, these macros, these uh, primitives that I referred to earlier, they also qualify as available components. So we reused the concept of available component to make sure that that covered as well this type of components that people would not be able to license as open source anyway. And, and without this clause, uh, using, you know, for example, the existing software, reciprocal software licenses for IC design is virtually impossible because it's, it's really impossible not to use uh, these, these uh, proprietary blocks uh, in most of the designs. So this is really to, to reflect the realities of this um, domain of hardware design. So just to illustrate very briefly uh, how CERN OHL would work for a printed circuit board design, imagine you have a project which so far is proprietary because you have not licensed it under any open source license, and you want to use a bit of uh, schematics and layout uh, from a design which is open hardware licensed. Uh, and uh, depending on the variant of CERN OHL that it uses, it, it will have different consequences for you. So here's the... Um, um, the, the piece of schematics used in your design as a hierarchical block. Here's the piece of layout that you take from this OHL design and you put in your design. And if the original CERN OHL design was the, uh, released under the permissive variant, your obligations are just to acknowledge uh, the author and, and nothing else. You don't need to uh, provide any source code, any, uh, any of your schematics. Uh, if you take uh, a design that was licensed under the weekly reciprocal variant, then you should release the contents of this uh, hierarchical block and this piece of layout and any modifications you do to them. And if uh, the original CERN OHL design was under the strongly reciprocal variant, then you should release the whole thing, including your higher level uh, PCB design. Okay, so that's about the theory. Um, let's go to the practice, practical side. Uh, I'd like to show you very briefly uh, our main open source hardware project at CERN. It's called White Rabbit. 
it is a, a synchronization technology. Uh, what it does is that it makes sure that different pieces of equipment which are distant with respect to one another of several kilometers share a common notion of time uh, and to a precision which is uh, very, very high. So uh, they agree on the current time to within one nanosecond, to within one billionth of a second. And this is necessary in several places at CERN and elsewhere, as I will say later. But just to give you an example, uh, here's a picture of a synchrotron, which is a special type of particle accelerator. The LHC is a synchrotron. And particles, they circulate inside the beam pipe. And whenever they hit one of these radio frequency cavities, they get a kick, they get accelerated. In the beginning, they gain velocity, they gain speed, and at the end they are very, very close to the speed of light, and they just gain energy, momentum, uh, but that's still something that's useful because when they are made to collide, all that energy will be available to create new particles. So uh, at the same time as they gain energy, they become harder to bend in their trajectories and to, to, make, to be made to stay within the beam pipe. So at the same time, you have these white blocks, which are the bending magnets. They are electromagnets with windings in which we inject many thousands of amperes of current uh, to create a very intense magnetic field that will bend the trajectory of particles so that they, they don't continue on a straight line and go, get out of the uh, beam pipe, but they continue on this circular trajectory. And there's a synchronization problem in, in, in the sense that the acceleration on the radio frequency cavities has to proceed in synchronism with the ramping up of the current in the electromagnets, because as, 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 as the particles become harder and harder to, uh, to, uh, to bend uh, in their trajectories, we need to ramp up uh, the, the current in the magnet, so the, the magnetic field is accordingly uh, strong uh, so that they stay in the, uh, in the beam pipe. This is just one example. There are many other examples of needs for synchronization among systems in the LHC and in the other accelerators. So, White Rabbit is a, a technology which extends Ethernet. So this is another uh, one of our strategic choices, capitalize on existing standards and improve on them. And we will see later how we standardized uh, the White Rabbit improvements uh, under IEEE 1588. So anything you can do with Ethernet, you can do with White Rabbit. Uh, and, and then White Rabbit brings in two new things. One is sub-nanosecond synchronization, as I just said. So whenever you connect a node in a white rabbit network, it automatically gets this common notion of time with respect to everybody else to within one nanosecond. And the other thing uh, that we very often use in combination with the first one is uh, a, a guaranteed upper bound in the latency, in the time it takes for a message to go from node A to node B in a white rabbit network. So typically, uh, in practice, what happens is that there, are, there is a hierarchy of white rabbit switches connected uh, with one another, and then some of them are actually also connected to nodes where the actual work on the accelerators happens. And then uh, the, uh, how, how does this network co get completely synchronized uh, is we simplify things and we make it a one-to-one -one problem. So uh, we have a, a data and time master that gets official time from GPS, and then it uh, it disciplines the time in whatever switches are connected to it, and this happens in a cascaded way so that one switch disciplines another, and, uh, and then and the final switch disciplines the nodes. So it's always a one-to-one -one affair, uh, uh, making sure that things are synchronized, and the essential ingredient is how to find the length of the fiber connecting them. Because if, if I asked you how to... Uh, synchronize, how to make sure that the slaves have the same time as the master, uh, one obvious way of doing it is the master sends a message saying, for me it's midday, and then upon reception of that message, uh, the slave would say, okay, I set my clock to midday. But the problem with that is that in the best of cases, uh, it will take a few microseconds for the data to move through a switch and um, through the length of fiber necessary to reach the, uh, the node so that by the time it is received, the time is already off by a few microseconds, which is uh, a big deal for us, of course, and for many applications, as you will see later. So uh, there is a standard way of doing this that has been known for a long time in, in networking, uh, which consists of sending messages back and forth and, and timestamping these messages, and then uh, using those timestamps to calculate the length of the fiber.
So in this diagram, time moves downward. This is on the master and this is on the slave. And um, it all begins with a message from the master, which is timestamped T1 in the master's clock. It is received at time T2 in the slave's clock. Uh, then after some time, the slave sends back a message timestamped T3 in the slave's clock, uh, which is received in time T4 in the master clock. And then with, when you have those four numbers, T1, T2, T3, and T4, you can calculate the one-way delay in the fiber. So uh, the one-way delay would be the total delay, which is T4 minus T1, the whole, the, the, the whole time that the whole back and forth took, minus the, this dead time in the slave, which is T3 minus T2, divided by two, because we assume that the two-way delay is twice the, the one-way delay. Okay. And this is a scheme that's actually used in, in your laptops, in your desktops to get time, to get them to display the right time in your mobile phones as well. Uh, the innovation in White Rabbit is that instead of milliseconds, which is typical, the typical precisions you get in, in computers, you get uh, six orders of magnitude better. It's, uh, it's uh, nanoseconds instead of milliseconds. So, uh, in terms of hardware, there is the White Rabbit switch. It contains, um, it is made of a, a physical mechanical enclosure. Inside there are PCBs with uh, programmable components, FPGAs, also processors uh, running Linux, and uh, HDL, so hardware description language based designs for the field programmable gate arrays for the, for the time sensitive part of the actions that happen inside the switch. Otherwise, it's completely compliant with Ethernet, and all this is open source hardware. The, the mechanical enclosure, the PCBs, the gateway, so the, the HDL in the FPGAs, and the uh, software running in the, in the processor. And it's available from many vendors, so there's no vendor lock-in uh, risk because it's fully open source, and, uh, and there are uh, several vendors which are active uh, and have these in their catalogs. In terms of nodes, this is an example of a PCI Express board in which uh, we can plug mezzanine cards, so add-in plug-in boards that customize its functionality. So the carrier is generic. It has this programmable component, this FPGA, and it has a white rabbit port. And then, for example, you can plug an ADC board, an analog to digital converter, and uh, by virtue of the, it being um, in, a, in a carrier which is White Rabbit enabled, it can, you can make uh, synchronous acquisitions. You can make data acquisition with uh, very precise timestamps that you can correlate with other nodes later on. And again, this is commercial open source hardware available for, from several companies. Uh, in terms of use, it all started uh, in our circle of friends, so to speak. We have, uh, of course, uh, tight links with uh, other particle accelerators complexes, and in particular with GSI in Germany, which is like our sister lab. Um, this was a very natural um, stretch to use that in, in GSI. Uh, then also very natural to go beyond particle accelerators, but still in physics. So this is an example of an array of detectors for cosmic rays in China, near Tibet. And uh, the idea is that you have these uh, very highly energetic events in our galaxy and, uh, and beyond, actually, uh, that will spell out uh, highly energetic particles, charged particles that will hit the uh, uh, upper layers of our atmosphere and then result in a shower of uh, particles that can be detected in the ground. And by detecting them in different physical places in an array of places like here uh, and if all those places are very very well synchronized with with respect to one another you can calculate the, the incoming direction of the shower so that you can you can see where in space this very high energy ev event took place and you can use it to study things like dark energy and, and dark matter which are uh, the biggest mysteries in in, in cosmology today uh, similarly for neutrinos, neutrinos are these uh, particles which are extremely hard to detect because they hardly interact with matter. Uh, it's a similar concept, except here we have a neutrino uh, detector which is made of many synchronized sub-detectors lying on the bed of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, more than 2,000 meters uh, under the surface of the water, and uh, they detect high-energy neutrinos coming from uh, uh, distant galaxies. Uh, then, 
also something which was relatively uh, uh, natural was um, meteorology offices. You know, in each country there is a laboratory in charge of official time. In the UK, it's the uh, National Physical Laboratory, NPL. Uh, this is an example from our friends in Finland, who uh, actually have the record for the longest white rabbit link between Espo and Kajani, more than 900 kilometers. And many other users that we try to keep track of, and this is one of the issues with open source, if one really wants to know the impact, it's kind of manual, you know, hearsay, it's, uh, it's impossible to know exactly what's using, who's using your designs. Um, we accept it, it's fine, of course, and we, we know it, the impact is there, but it would be nice to have a way to quantify it. Uh, so whenever we know, we put, it, put them in our list of users, uh, but we know there are many people out there using them that we don't know of. So um, then we, we open sourced WhiteRabbit, of course, and we even standardized it, and then the magic of open source operates, and people find unexpected applications. Like, for example, this is an idea to uh, synchronize mobile base stations and use the fact that they are very, very well synchronized with respect to one another to locate victims of accidents, thanks to um, the beat sent from their mobile phone to each one of the stations. You can triangulate, timestamp that, uh, reception of that beat, and um, and uh, by triangulation finding the exact location of the of the person with the mobile phone. Another idea already put into practice is the synchronization in smart grids. You know that uh, electrical power distribution is evolving. Uh, many people are becoming producers and consumers of electricity at the same time, and you need uh, a very fine orchestration of this traffic of. Um, power, of electrical power, and in order to do that, the controller node needs to be made aware of, uh, very precisely, of the phase of the 50 hertz waveform, the, the voltage and current waveform in each one of the premises. Uh, so that's also a, a domain in which White Rabbit is being used. Uh, then some words about standardization. We went through the process of standardizing White Rabbit under IEEE 1588, which is um, uh, the precise time protocol. So it's the most natural fit for White Rabbit. So now there's something called high accuracy profile in inside IEEE 1588. And that's kind of the ideas of White Rabbit generalized. Uh, there are many benefits. I just uh, mentioned the two main ones I perceive. One is inertia, which is uh, a bit of counterintuitive because some people complain that standardizing is slow, but this, the slowness is very often a feature. And in particular, when we uh, were the sole owners of the White Rabbit specification, there was a risk for companies that we would change our minds and in the course of a weekend uh, change the specification and then we, will, well, we would pull the rug from beneath their feet. So it was not a very um, safe situation for them to be in. Uh, standard and the fact that standard is difficult to modify is a feature in the sense that you can rely on it uh, not being changed from one day to the next. Also, the impact is much bigger, of course, because there are many bodies that uh, prefer, many, many companies, many institutes that prefer to use things which are standard and for good reason. So the impact is bigger if you standardize your technology. On the slightly negative side, it takes a lot of effort, but I think it was worth it in our case. It takes many years, actually, of phone calls and face-to-face -face meetings, discussing with people with different agendas, different priorities, uh, coming from the commercial world and from the uh, uh, public institutions. Uh, so it is tricky, but I think it's worth it. And then I, I think I should mention also, because I, I, there was even a, an event in the European Commission last year uh, on the tension, which is an essential kind of fundamental tension uh, between patents and uh, reciprocal open source licenses. Uh, so people come to these standardization bodies with uh, a number of patents that they hold, and some of them end up being in the standard in the sense that you cannot implement the standard without using these patents. Okay, it, They are called standard essential patents because you cannot really avoid them. And uh, patents uh, work in a certain way. In particular, if you want to use them, you need to get permission from their owner. And uh, reciprocal so open source licenses give you permission to do anything you like or most of the things you would like. Um, without asking for permission. So there is a fundamental tension, tension which is um, sometimes difficult to navigate. Uh, so to finish, I would like to submit some thoughts on public institutions. 
and their role in open source. So uh, I tend to think of public institutions as not very different from private ones, except for the fact that private ones uh, represent the interests of a subset of the population, namely their stockholders and their owners. And uh, public institutions, uh, they just defend the interests of a much bigger set of people, which is the whole society. So, uh, or, or in, in some cases, a, a subset of that society, but still big. So, uh, we, we try to maximize the positive, the, the positive impact of our decisions. And, and uh, for example, in the case of a technology developed in a public institution, shall we open source it? Shall we not open source it? Uh, sometimes it's not an easy decision. If you're thinking about how to maximize impact, very often open sourcing is, is what makes the most sense, but sometimes it's not as easy. One role we can have is uh, that of a tractor institution because many open source projects take some time to uh, arrive at, at the state of maturity where they can self-sustain commercially. And uh, those first years, uh, you need somebody uh, who has it in their mandate to contribute to these commons without expecting uh, an immediate retribution. And I think that public institutions are ideally uh, positioned to play that role. We also can help reach critical mass because we have many friends in other public institutions that could use maybe the same developments. And then when these things um, become mature, uh, we also have another hat, which is, you know, we can help develop them, but we also have our procurement hat, so we can become users, clients, customers, and, uh, and we can have uh, open source as uh, uh, our priority when it comes to purchasing as well. So public institutions uh, often have it in their mandates to contribute to the commons, uh, but sometimes it is not easy, uh, and sometimes there are um, uh, incentives which are not conducive to, uh, to this um, enhancement of the commons. And in particular, when you ask uh, a complete public institution or a subset of it, like the Knowledge Transfer Office or the Technology Transfer Office, to self-finance, uh, because the route to, uh, to monetization is very clear in proprietary developments and sometimes not so clear for open source, uh, that could introduce uh, some kind of bias and uh, it could lead the public institution to decide to publish something under a proprietary license which could have less impact but more quantifiable and, and more monetization. Okay? So you're sacrificing sometimes global impact for these uh, smaller goals. And um, I, I think it would help in our um, advocacy efforts uh, with, with uh, knowledge transfer and technology transfer offices if, uh, if, if somebody solved the impact tracking problem to some extent, how to, how to make sure that we have a quantifiable impact in open source, and also the retribution issues. There are many discussions today in the software world, people even inventing new licenses, uh, a lot of controversy because they want to call them open source, well, well they're probably not. And, uh, but the underlying problem that they're trying to solve is to, to have a fair retribution for uh, people who develop open source. And this could also help with public institutions, which sometimes are asked to self-finance totally or partially. And finally, I wanted to submit to you um, uh, a business model, which is, I think, the, the one we're using mostly in White Rabbit. I, I have always thought of the way we do White Rabbit with companies as open core, except open core has a bad reputation in some circles, especially for software. So I, I was wondering what makes it different, what makes uh, White Rabbit uh, a different open core uh, uh, project. And uh, many times in the open core software projects, uh, the uh, actor, the main actor in the project uh, is the one in charge of the core, but also of the proprietary plugins. And there could be a conflict of interest in the sense that uh, the monetization for the company in charge of the project or the main actor in charge of the project comes from these proprietary plugins. So there is a temptation to have a, a barely usable open core. So uh, a community edition of the software, which is barely useful, uh, barely usable, so that you push the people to get the proprietary plugins. Uh, in, in White Rabbit, the open core is actually uh, uh, 
uh, done by CERN and other public institutions, which have all the interest in the world to make it expand as much as possible. So there is this dynamics, this time dimension, whereby there is this open core made of the switches and of the um, basic blocks of the nodes uh, that is constantly expanding. There are companies pr um, innovating in a proprietary way in the periphery and having bigger margins for that. They also contribute to the core and they also sell switches, but they, are, they have smaller margins in that core of the project. They have bigger margins in the periphery where they, they innovate in a proprietary way. And then there is this time dimension whereby the core under our influence and that of our friends expands and covers territory that was previously covered by proprietary development. So the proprietary uh, developments in companies have to move elsewhere. They have to innovate further out from the core. Okay, so uh, I think this is a nice equilibrium. And in our case, uh, it has turned out to be quite healthy. So we have both a very healthy core and, uh, uh, and a set of companies uh, which are happy to work with White Rabbit. I have noticed that in the world of open source hardware, uh, there are some of the business models from software that don't quite work, or we have not seen companies attracted by those business models. For example, the provision of support uh, on top of an open source product, that's something that uh, users don't seem to find interesting, and therefore companies are not uh, providing that kind of uh, support. Uh, so that business model doesn't seem to work so so well. So uh, for me, this is uh, uh, probably what I'm explaining here is nothing new. I don't claim to make to have made any invention, but sometimes giving it a name helps. So I, I call it public core, and uh, it is something that we have found to work quite nicely and I would be interested in hearing your opinions. So with that, I, I concluded and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. That's really uh, great. Um, yes, uh, any questions? I think we've already had a couple come in in the chat box. I think Amanda's already asked me to ask one, so I'll, I'll start off with that one from her. Um, so Amanda's question is, uh, what's the biggest single benefit of having OSI approval for the license for both you, Javier, and for CERN itself? Yes, uh, I think the, there, are, there are two benefits. One is on the uh, matter of principles side of thing, and the other one is a very pragmatic kind of um, benefit. So the first one is that we have worked on and off not full time, but we have worked five years on this version two of the CERN OHL. And uh, one of our guiding principles was, was to make it open source. And uh, we would really like to know, and uh, we got the answer uh, a few weeks ago, uh, whether this is really open source and who do you ask? So um, we, we talked to the Free Software Foundation because we also want it to be compliant with the four freedoms. And we asked the question to OSI, um, as to whether this is compliant with the open source definition and, and whether it could be included in the list. So that's the matter of principles argument. It is very important for us because it was a lot of effort and we really wanted to make sure that this is open source. Um, and the second reason is, is very pragmatic. There are many people, it's for adoption. We want to have an impact. We want to, this to be useful. And uh, there are many companies and institutes which for good, for good reason uh, say, if you're going to use open source, uh, you shall use a license which is in the list of accepted and approved licenses by OSI. In particular, if you want to be in the list of GitHub or, or GitLab.com or other similar platforms for sharing designs online, if you want your license to appear in the drop-down menu that people get when they create a project, uh, one of the conditions is to be approved by OSI. So those are the two main benefits I can see. Cool, thank you. I think that leads on to the question that's come up from uh, DevTank. Uh, they say, hi, Javier, uh, please could you explain the key difference between the CERN v2 licenses and the CER OHL v1.2? Okay, uh, there were a number of improvements. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, be, I'm going to uh, be able to cover all of them. And they are, there is a, a very extensive FAQ entry uh, on the website of the CERN OHL, and one of the questions is exactly that. So if I forget, uh, something, let me know, or just go there and, and see the whole list. Uh, but um, 
yeah, clarity, clarity was one of the goals. So um, these, uh, the extent of reciprocal obligations, clarifying that. Okay, the first main big, big difference is the three variants. There, 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 there used to be a single license, and which was kind of sometimes interpreted as strong uh, strongly reciprocal, sometimes weakly reciprocal, depending on how you looked at things. So now we have three clear different variants. Uh, then another big thing is that we acknowledged, we noticed that for HDL design, which is this gateway, this kind of the way people design integrated circuits, we came to the realization that existing reciprocal licenses were not adequate, the, the software licenses. So we set it as one of the goals for version two to be applicable, especially for the W and the S variants, the, the two reciprocal variants, for them to be applicable to IC design and FPGA design. That was another uh, big chunk of work. Uh, then, as I say, clarity, the, the, the notions of available components, uh, that was very, very important. Uh, and I think also the, the reciprocal clause for patents, we didn't have it in the beginning, so there was only a patent license that we as licensor give, but uh, this kind of um, retaliation clause, if, if a licensee sues you for patent infringement, that's, that was uh, present in other licenses and we took the idea from them. Uh, so that was also an improvement, yes. Copying is the best form of flattery always, isn't it? Of course. <laughs> it's a good idea, why not use it? Yeah, yeah. yeah very true. Um, are there any other questions? If anyone would like to come on, just ask a question on voice, feel free. Or if not, I think Amanda's got a few comments on the um, on the public call. Ah, John, John, uh, do you want to ask your question or shall I go for it? I'll, I'll read it out then. Uh, so how important were people's personal passions for an open source commons and its social benefits a driver for all this effort? Sammy, I'll come to you after. Yes, I, I think it's uh, many people who work at CERN, already the decision to come to work at CERN is, is very much driven by people's personal passions. Uh, and as I tried to convey in the beginning of the talk, we, we see these efforts as very much aligned with the mandate of CERN. So the answer is yes, definitely, there is that component of things, uh, but it starts even earlier. It starts when you apply to work on a public institution with such a, a great mandate, which is kind of enhance the knowledge of everybody. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it, it starts there, and it's, it's, it, then it's a logical consequence to, to work on things like this or an open hardware license. When, whenever you identify something that you could help with, uh, and in particular here, we wanted to uh, share hardware designs, and we, we, we saw that there was no legally satisfactory way of doing it. So we try to solve that problem for ourselves and for the rest of the world. Thank you, that's good. Uh, Sammy, I'm assuming you have a question. Yeah, hi, <laughs> hi Javier, really, really good uh, and good to see you again, Javier. Um, Thank you. Just a question on the, I, I have to admit, I have not looked at the, um, the, the licenses uh, recently, uh, but a, an interesting question in relation to the, um, uh, the, the sort of strong copyleft um, uh, license. Does that extend to um, things like validation environment and verification, which is very often the value, you know, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 if it's only limited to the RTL, for example, uh, mm -hmm. that is actually not of a great value, whereas, uh, whereas um, for a bigger design, you would want to have all that verification and validation and test environment to ensure that mm -hmm. whatever you manufacture at the end is in, indeed conformant yeah. with, mm -hmm. with with the, yes, with the, yes. or the architecture. I can give you my intent, uh, and my intent, which, uh, as you know, probably better than me, is important in some respect, yeah. uh, is is uh, is that they they are not covered. They, that this uh, the verification effort is not covered unless explicitly made available under the CERN Open Hardware License. Uh, if you only release the design files, uh, the definition of product in the license is whatever you make with the design files. So right. I, I don't think that um, that the uh, and 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 conversely, the definition of sources is whatever helps you make the product. Uh, I, I think the verification suite uh, is not necessary to make the product. So so in principle, it should not be covered. And it was our intent to leave them out so that people could take the independent choice of actually licensing them explicitly or not. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's obviously it's debatable whether by making uh, the design files that 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 would be su sufficient to be hundred percent certain that actually this is um, this is conformant to the you know I mean it's something as you know for for CPUs or GPUs or more hefty um, yes. uh, designs. I would argue that the value is more around the validation than 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 the yeah. RTL that uh, that you release. So yeah. again, you could argue it both ways. But you know, it, it, it's 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 good to have clarity because then people are very clear that that does not extend to anything else beyond. Yes. Yes. Uh, also, if I can uh, uh, provide some extra information that could be useful in this in this context. Um, we're working also on certification uh, for open hardware. Uh, that's more with OSHUA, with the Open Source Hardware Association, and also with the FOSI Foundation. Um, so that, that can reach beyond what a license can do. So that you can say, in, if you want to be certified open hardware uh, for a chip, this is what it means. And then this is probably a more natural place to inject these kind of requirements uh, to say, look, we know that in the business of making ICs, it is absolutely crucial uh, to supply all the verification software. Therefore, if you want this certification mark, then make sure that you supply not only the design files, but also all the ver verification suite. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more question from Jorge. Um, is there a bank of open hardware and open software by CERN? Sorry, a bank? Yes, is I'm there a, bank, a... So a software bank. Uh, is there a list, I guess, of the software yes, and the open yes. hardware that's supported? Ah, I see. Um, actually, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, there is the open hardware repository, of course, where we hold most of our designs, ohwr.org. Uh, so that's uh, already most of the CERN open hardware designs are there. For open source software, I am not aware, uh, but actually I am doing manually this effort because there is, uh, for those of you who know, currently uh, a European Commission project whose task is to identify um, pieces of open source software which are critical to the operation of public institutions to make sure that they are properly funded. So I am the, I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm one of the link persons at CERN to carry out that work uh, and to feed it to this project. So I should know in the coming weeks if there is a place where all this information is stored, otherwise I will have to do it manually. Uh, Javier, I am, I, am, I am asking that because right now with the pandemic, many institutions for education and healthcare need quickly uh, rapid solutions and we need mm -hmm. to know what is available to face the pandemic mm -hmm. yes we need that solution uh, very quickly mm -hmm. yes uh, I, I know yes I, I i don't think there is such a repository curated and organized that can be easily searchable I don't know about that. I know of several projects in the open hardware repository for ventilators, for masks, for face shields, which are all open hardware. Uh, but I, I don't think there is the type of resource that you're mentioning. I am not aware of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more from John. Um, any comment on the impact or adoption of Risk V this decade at CERN? Uh, it's very present. And in fact, it's uh, we designed one in the in the in the beginning in the in the frenzy of uh, in 2015 it was where everybody was writing their own Risk Five core just for fun because it was great it was this uh, freedom experience you know <laughs> a, a completely uh, an instruction set architecture completely devoid of patents uh, and it was great and we're still using Risk Five and for example when we need full control like for example we need we need to re to run software in radioactive environments sometimes. And, um, and avoid uh, single event upsets in the electronics. So we need to triplicate the logic. So we really need to be uh, in full control of the hardware. Then we use our RISC-V core. So we are users of that. And also we use it in our advocacy efforts as an example of, uh, because, because some, sometimes, you know, at CERN, we have this, what I call the, uh, the funding agencies conundrum. Uh, some people could say, wait, your money, your funding is coming from a subset of the countries in the world. Uh, why are you giving this all away for free to all the countries, including those who didn't contribute? And I, I, I use more and more the example of RISC-V, which was originated in the United States, uh, published for free, 
and uh, it has a, a huge economic impact uh, and it will have even more impact in the future in uh, in Europe uh, and it has played even it, I think it will also play even a, a role in the in the in the so-called uh, digital sovereignty uh, but uh, the biggest economic impact the biggest positive economic impact was geographically close to the to the original place where it was developed in Berkeley so so it created a market that did, didn't exist it benefited Europe and many other places but it benefited the US most so everybody wins Thank you. Um, unless there's any other questions, I know we're kind of getting a little over our time slot. So unless there's anything else burning that somebody would like to ask. Then it just leaves me to say thank you so much for joining us today, Javier. That was a fantastic talk and really great for answering all those very <laughs> wide and diverse and interesting mm -hmm. questions as well. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, tomorrow Open UK will be at the uh, Digital FOSTEM 2021. So we hope to see some of you there. And next week, we'll be joined by our very own Amanda Brock, and she'll be talking about commercial and business models and making them work for open source. And uh, it's going to be fun because we're going to be joined by Drawnalism, who are artists that work live and in person to create a paper or digital record of conferences and other events. And they're gifting us a drawing and a live blog for our next our talk next week. So that's going to be fun. Um, Amanda will be covering commercial models and open source and also touching on the recent move by Elastic to the SSPL, which I'm sure will give them lots to be drawing and writing about. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I hope that was uh, that was good. And uh, yeah, speak to you all next week, if not tomorrow. Take care. Thank you.